Hi, it's Katrina. The Caral Supe Civilization. Near the coast of Peru, there are huge mounds of stone and earth rising up from the sandy desert like natural formations. They almost look like crumbling hills made from hard stone. But in reality, these mounds are ancient pyramids from 5,000 years ago, standing in the remains of what might be the oldest urban center in the Americas. This mysterious site, known only as Caral, was studied by the Peruvian archaeologist Ruth Shady Solis from San Marcos University. The complex is over 150 acres of ruined pyramids, plazas, and residential buildings. It was once a thriving city at around the same time that the pyramids in Egypt were being constructed, making it one of the first advanced cities in the world. Ruth believes Caral is behind the mysterious origins of the Inca. The size and scope of the city is simply astounding. The biggest pyramid still standing, Piramide Mayor, covers an area amassing to four football fields and stands 60 feet tall. It has more than three terraced levels and would have taken thousands of laborers and countless hours to build. By 1600 BC, the Caral civilization had spread through the Supe Valley and constructed at least 17 other pyramids. They were a massive civilization, but they vanished overnight. Even stranger is that they knew they were about to disappear. Many of their greatest architectural achievements were buried under heaps of dirt to protect them from whatever mysterious threat wiped them out. Ruth Solis also believes the Caral civilization was the mother city of the Incan civilization. She thinks it's possible that the Inca began in the city of Caral, but after its destruction, went somewhere else. Then, after several centuries, they were able to regroup to form the Inca Empire. The Indus Utopia For over 700 years, the Indus civilization was a utopia. In the Indus Valley of India, this great culture flourished at the dawn of humanity beginning roughly 5,000 years ago. They were one of the first advanced civilizations, building huge cities with upwards of 40,000 residents each. One of their greatest settlements was the city of Mohenjo-Daro, a place that boasted sewage systems, household plumbing, standardized currency, and strong trade links across the globe. Currency from the Indus Valley has been found as far away as the Middle East, proving Mohenjo-Daro became rich by trading with other mighty empires. At their prime, they covered much of Pakistan, India, and parts of Afghanistan. But what makes the people of the Indus civilization so unique is that researchers say they never practiced war. They were a utopia, a peaceful group of humans who didn't follow any dictators or kings, and who never fashioned a single weapon or marched into a single battle. We know this because although archaeologists have excavated multiple cities belonging to the Indus people, they haven't found even one palace or temple. Every city has shown evidence of the residents sharing almost the exact same amount of wealth. Nobody ruled over anybody else in a great big castle, and there appear to have been no temples dedicated to strange deities. As far as anyone can tell, the Indus civilization had no kings and lived peaceful lives in harmony with their neighbors. However, that tranquility ended about 4,000 years ago when the civilization collapsed overnight. Some experts say climate change played a role, while others claim their unwillingness to go to war left them vulnerable to be conquered. The Etruscans Before there were Romans, there were Etruscans. Some of the first kings of Rome came from Etruria, as well as highly advanced knowledge that helped the Romans succeed in conquering much of the world. For decades, scientists have tried to figure out who the Etruscans were and where exactly they came from. In the 5th century BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote that they came from a faraway land and migrated to the Italian peninsula thousands of years prior. However, a recent genetic survey has confirmed that the Etruscans in fact came from Italy. The DNA from over 82 people who lived between the years 800 BC and 1000 AD shows that Etruscans lived in Italy before anyone else. Even more interesting is that they were almost genetically identical to their neighbors in Rome. The Etruscans were unique because for hundreds of years, as people migrated throughout Europe and populations mixed and merged, 
they remained widely undisturbed in Italy. They ruled a massive amount of land between Rome and Florence, along with the island of Corsica. They also had their own distinct language that was different from other European languages like Greek. But according to Ben Turner from Life Science, the Etruscans just couldn't hold off against the Romans and were beaten down in the 3rd century BC. By 90 BC, Etruria had been completely assimilated into the Roman Republic. The advanced architecture, artistic styles, and even Etruscan culture were all absorbed and then used by the Romans. To this day, scientists don't understand why the Etruscans lasted so long or how they came to be defeated by their small neighbors to the south. The Old Copper Culture Some of the first people in the world to start manipulating copper were Native Americans. About 10,000 years ago near the Great Lakes, the Old Copper Culture began to fashion objects out of pure copper. It was a major technological triumph for Native Americans, seeing as copper was a huge boost above ordinary stone. They were able to mine copper, then transform the raw material into extraordinarily sharp arrowheads for hunting. But then something strange happened. After thousands of years as coppersmiths, the Native Americans stopped and returned to making tools out of stone and bone. They went backwards, and nobody can quite figure out why. The old copper culture isn't exactly a civilization, but a group of people from the Great Lakes region identified based on archaeological finds from between 7500 and 1000 BC. The people of this culture learned very early how to smelt copper and practice metal casting in the western Great Lakes. They practiced a nomadic existence and relied on hunting and fishing. However, after they started to produce metal tools, they stopped after 3,000 years. It seemed like they gave up making copper instruments and started only using the metal for things like beads and bracelets. This has archaeologists scratching their heads because it's the opposite of what other cultures did. When European cultures figured out how to make copper, they kept experimenting with the technology and became more and more advanced. But the Native Americans in the Great Lakes went the other way. They used copper for a bit, then went back to the old-fashioned rock and bone. The Ban Chiang Culture The oldest Bronze Age culture in the world may have developed in Thailand. Excavations at the small village of Ban Chiang in northeast Thailand revealed evidence of prehistoric bronze forging dating back to roughly 3000 BC. This is shocking because it shows that the ancient people of Thailand were the first to cross from the Stone Age into the Bronze Age, more than 1,000 years before the Middle East. This discovery flipped everything we know about world history on its head. Up until that point, Turkey and Iran were considered the first places in the world to enter the Bronze Age. However, it seems a small group of ingenious people dwelling in the Thai jungle figured it out first. These were people who migrated into Thailand about 20,000 years ago. They became one of the oldest rice-based civilizations, cultivating rice starting around 3500 BC. There was such an abundance of food that the Ban Chiang culture never really had to worry about famines. This allowed the ancient Thai people to focus on other things, like the development of metals. Still, it wouldn't be for another 2,000 years that real kingdoms began to rise in Thailand. At the end of the first millennium BC, tribal territories started merging with one another to create proto-historical kingdoms. These kingdoms would ultimately lead to the development of the Dvaravati culture in the 9th century AD, and soon after, the mighty kingdoms of ancient Thailand. The Persian Empire The Persian civilization was the most scientific of all the civilizations on Earth during their reign. Persia, or modern-day Iran, was occupied by little more than sheep herders and nomadic tribes 2,500 years ago. However, the leader of one of those tribes, Cyrus the Great, began marching against other tribes, forcing them to join his kingdom under one rule. By the year 550 BC, he had conquered Media, Lydia, and Babylon, in turn forming the powerful Achaemenid Empire. This really was the first superpower. Cyrus the Great had managed to collect three of the most important human civilizations under one government. He had Mesopotamia, the Nile Valley in Egypt, and the Indus Valley in India. 
Not only did the Persians have the largest army the world had ever seen, but they also had highly advanced technology. They mastered the technique of building natural refrigerators by 400 BC, which were called yakchal and could be used to keep food cold even in the heat of the desert. They came up with sulfuric acid, discovered by Persian astronomer Abu Bakr Muhammad, and today it's used to make everything from fertilizer to detergent. The Persians also invented backgammon, the postal service, and the concept of basic human rights. An earthenware goblet found in an ancient Persian city, an artifact depicting a series of goat drawings, is the first example of animation in the world. The goat jumps toward a tree and eats its leaves when the goblet is turned in the proper direction, making the Persians, not Walt Disney, the real pioneers of animation. The Nakadon Culture Before the ancient Egyptians ruled the lands of the Nile and built great pyramids, there was the Nakadon civilization. In 4500 BC, they became the predominant culture in Upper Egypt, operating out of a capital city named Nakada. The civilization was made up of individual villages, with each village boasting its own animal deity. The primitive kingdom was divided based on which animal was worshipped, and this was the beginning for what would become the dominant religion of ancient Egypt for thousands of years. As you may already know, the Egyptian gods were mostly based on animals. These animal deities began as primitive gods over 1,000 years before Egypt was unified into one country. The Nakata also buried their dead loved ones with small statuettes to keep them company in the afterlife. These were some of the earliest grave goods and the precursor for the wildly complex burial rituals of the ancient Egyptians. As the civilization continued to advance and develop more complicated artistic tendencies, things began to change. By 3000 BC, Upper and Lower Egypt were divided in half. Upper Egypt worshipped Horus and Nekbet, while Lower Egypt worshipped Set and Wadjet. After a great and terrible war, Upper Egypt defeated Lower Egypt and unified the country as one. And that was when the great civilization of ancient Egypt was truly born. The Neolithic Boyan Culture The Neolithic Boyan culture appeared in southern Romania roughly 7,000 years ago, and they were one of the first human groups to build settlements in Eastern Europe. The culture was characterized by unique terrace settlements. They began by building mud huts, but over thousands of years, they upgraded to more complex settlements. Their biggest achievement was constructing what archaeologists say could be the first fortified settlements in Romania, which was a major turning point in civilization. They were also the first to introduce copper axes. This was a big deal because it showed forward thinking and ingenuity. The Boyan culture lasted until their demise in 3500 BC, when they started venturing north along the Black Sea and encountered the Neolithic Hamangia culture. The Hamangia culture was bigger and stronger, and they eventually absorbed the Boyan. What happened next was one of the biggest steps in the evolution of society. These two Neolithic cultures, really no more than primitive hunters who managed to build mud huts and wooden walls, formed the Kukuteni Tripilian culture. They then became the biggest human civilization in Eastern Europe. They were only destroyed when a rival civilization from the east invaded their territory, and scholars believe the Kukuteni Tripilian culture was most likely absorbed. Looking at this today, we can really see what happened here. Each small culture was absorbed by a bigger one until about 5,000 years ago, when true civilizations began to rise in Europe. Teotihuacan Civilization 30 miles from Mexico City is the capital of the Teotihuacan culture. It's believed to be named after the mysterious city of Teotihuacan, which was settled around 400 BC. By the time the Aztecs came across the city in the 15th century, the culture was already dead and gone. The city had been abandoned since at least 400 AD and had already been empty for 1,000 years before the Aztecs came across it. They didn't know why it had been abandoned, and it must have seemed like a huge mystery to them. They didn't know anything about the culture or origins of Teotihuacan, 
And in all honesty, we still don't. Modern archaeologists have speculated, but nobody has ever made any official proclamations. Some believe that the Toltec civilization built the huge city, but that's likely incorrect because the Toltec didn't arrive on the scene until Teotihuacan was already dead. Others suggest the Totonac tribe may have built and lived in the city. The Maya, the Mixtec, and even the Zapotec have also been brought up in discussion as being responsible. But the truth is that the mysterious culture who created this place is unknown. We do know they were wildly advanced, had a population of about 200,000 people, and yet they abandoned their pyramids, plazas, and great structures seemingly for no reason. It was almost as if they were all abducted by aliens at the same time. The Aegean Civilizations In the classical world of the Mediterranean, from between 3000 and 1200 BC, there were three main civilizations on the coast of the Aegean Sea. These civilizations thrived in what is now considered Greece. But it wasn't exactly Greeks who lived here. There were the Cycladic, the Minoan, and the Mycenaean civilizations. We know there was a ruling class in each of these cultures. The upper class lived in massive palaces, and the cities didn't really have much of a defense system. Most of the cities were built on islands, the economy was centered around commerce, and they were highly skilled artists. Interestingly, most of the stories from Greek mythology come from earlier stories told by these particular civilizations. Sadly, each of these civilizations fell in rapid succession. The Minoans were obliterated by a volcano, and the Cycladic peoples were disrupted by tsunamis and pirates. Then the Mycenaeans were killed off in 1200 BC by the Sea People, a mysterious race of seafarers who pillaged the remains of the Aegean civilizations. It wasn't for another 400 years until ancient Greece as we know it would emerge. The Yarmoukians the Yarmoukian civilization in Israel came before the Israelis, before the Palestinians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Many, many years ago, the Yarmoukians lived in modern-day Israel. Recently, archaeologists came across a shocking relic from the days of these ancient people, dating back to 8,000 years ago. The Yarmoukian are considered the first prehistoric culture in Israel to practice agriculture, and one of the oldest in the Levant to craft ceramic pottery. They were also some of the first to worship a mother goddess. There was a fertility cult that worshipped a mother earth-type figure, and it's this mother goddess that was just found by archaeologists memorialized in a large ceramic figurine. It was discovered next to the wall of an ancient house, broken but still in remarkable condition, considering how old it is. Some of the red that had once covered the statue was still visible, with the color red representing fertility. Anna Eirik Rose from the Israeli Antiquity Authority said this statue is a hallmark of Yarmoukian culture. She has big hips, a pointy hat, eyes shaped like coffee beans, and a large nose. Her eyes were most likely meant to represent kernels of wheat or barley, while the big hips represented childbearing. It's just a small representation of this lost culture, but still shows how incredibly advanced they were. These people lived at a pivotal point in human history when people stopped foraging and started building permanent settlements. The Stone Cult In Saudi Arabia, archaeologists found evidence of a highly advanced civilization which predates Stonehenge. The evidence was found in a vast and remote landscape in the northwest region called Al Ula. The buildings here date back way before other major ruins in the area, like those of Hegra and Adan. This area was occupied in the Neolithic period, from around 6000 to 4500 BC. There are over 30 dwellings and tombs scattered throughout the desert, and there could be a lot more that have either been totally destroyed or remain hidden under the dirt. There are also over 1,600 rectangular stone structures that date from around the same time, and researchers aren't sure what they are. They seem to be potential animal traps, pens used to catch galloping animals in huge numbers for sacrifice. The truth is that archaeologists don't know what they were used for, only that they were built by piling rocks into low walls and then filling in the gaps with gravel. They could have been used as the foundations of buildings. It's a complete mystery. 
One thing's for sure is that all these ruined buildings and mysterious structures are evidence of an organized society that predates Islam by about 6,000 years. These were highly advanced humans who had likely transitioned from hunting and gathering to building small stone homes and forming cults focused on animal sacrifice. The Comox Off the coast of Vancouver Island, British Columbia, in the area around Comox Bay, there is a field of wooden stakes stuck into the water. These wooden stakes appear when the tide goes out, looking like a bunch of broken pieces from sunken ships. These ancient wooden stakes jammed into the watery ground are complicated fish traps. They were left behind by the Comox First Nation people. These fishing traps were so uniquely good at capturing fish that the system had probably been able to catch thousands in a very short time. It was such a monumental achievement for the natives that it remained in use for over 1,000 years, starting sometime in the first millennium. The tragic part is that all these years later, even the modern descendants of the Comox who live in the area had no idea what the wooden stakes were. They knew they had something to do with fishing, but even the elders couldn't remember how they were used or what style of fishing it was. That all changed about 20 years ago when anthropology student Nancy Green started to investigate. It took a lot of time and a lot of studying, but she eventually learned the secret. The supposedly primitive Native Americans on Vancouver Island had created the largest ancient fishing trap ever found in North America, and possibly the biggest ancient fishing trap in the world. It's been described as a breathtaking display of engineering genius, and here's how it worked. The Native people used pieces of wood from the Douglas fir trees and western red cedars, somewhere around 200,000 of them, to make 300 individual traps. They then connected all the traps together over several acres of tidal lands and worked to gather mass amounts of fish. This huge trap fed around 12,000 people with pretty much no effort. They would have only had to go out and scoop up the fish. Sadly, the practice was forgotten when the Canadian government banned Indigenous people from practicing any of their traditions. Around the same time, they were kicked off their land and locked up in reservations. Palmyra the ancient archaeological site of Palmyra, found in modern-day Syria, was established sometime around the 3rd millennium BC. It began as a small settlement beside a fertile natural oasis, and eventually rose to become a major city in the Near East and a prosperous trading town on the Silk Road. There is no name for the people who first lived here in the Stone Age. Recorded history doesn't really start until around the 2nd millennium BC, when the Arameans controlled the city and it was a Mesopotamian settlement. The Arameans are a fascinating people because not only were they highly advanced and conquered much of the Near East and called the land Aram, but because they are also still around today, living mostly in Israel. When the Arabs arrived in Palmyra in the first millennium BC, they assimilated themselves with the existing population, and Palmyra became one of the world's first diversely populated cities. It became known as the Pearl of the Desert. It was an oasis in the middle of nowhere, so Palmyra became famous as a place of shelter and rest for traveling merchants and their caravans. Palmyra became rich and allied itself with the Seleucid Empire. However, when it fell, the Romans came. By the year 64 BC, the Romans had conquered Syria and Palmyra, although the city remained independent for a while, and there was a rich culture of people from all over the region including Romans and Persians. The Persians would go on to conquer the city in the 2nd century AD, and then the Roman Emperor Aurelian destroyed it out of spite in 273 AD. Palmyra was rebuilt shortly after, but from then on it never really reached any kind of glorious height. It was conquered, abandoned, and ruled over by so many different people that it lost all power and uniqueness until it was totally deserted in 1400. The Dinosaur Civilization The dinosaur civilization is just a theory, but it's related to the question, was there intelligent life before humans? This theory says that millions of years before our most distant ancestors arrived on this planet, there was a different civilization, a pre-human civilization that had technology, if not as great as ours, then at least pretty close. Because the truth is that after a couple million years following the extinction of this mysterious civilization, all trace of them would be gone. Any cities they would have built would have disintegrated. Whatever farms they may have grown would simply be reclaimed by nature. 
and even if they had plastic and metal, that too would ultimately decay given enough time. If humans were to vanish today, our buildings would be nothing but dirt in a few thousand years. Even the biggest cities we have wouldn't be recognizable in 10 million years. Let's say this ancient civilization, perhaps of human-like animals or some reptilian that grew a brain too big for its own good, only reached the technological level of the 1700s. There would be absolutely nothing left of them, nothing at all. For all we know, there was an entire civilization of intelligent beings that existed millions of years ago, but there is no way we would be able to tell. What do you think about this theory? Let me know in the comments below. And now it's shout out time. Big thank you to Samuel Hopper and Blaze Walsh for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. We'd love to have you. Rome and China. Ancient Rome and ancient China were two of the most technologically advanced civilizations in the world. Have you ever wondered if Rome and China knew about each other or what their relationship was? After all, Rome ruled everything to the west, while China dominated much of the lands to the east. It makes sense that they had at least heard of one another. And the truth is, they absolutely did. And it was all thanks to silk. When silk arrived in ancient Rome, spun and woven and transported along the Silk Road, the Romans loved it. Where do you think the term Silk Road came from? The Romans didn't really know where silk came from or how it was made. Old Roman sources even claimed that silk grew on trees, which is kind of half true. Silk cloth is woven from the silk taken from cocoons, which are left in the trees by silkworms. It was in the first century AD that General Pan Chao of the Han Dynasty sent an ambassador to Rome. At the time, the Chinese called the Roman Empire Da Qian. In the year 97, the ambassador from China journeyed along the Silk Road and wound up in Mesopotamia. He was planning on sailing the rest of the way to Rome, but was told that the journey would take up to two years. He was thwarted, gave up, and went back to China. No contact was made. It wouldn't be until the year 166 that contact was made. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius sent an envoy to China. This was a huge success and was the first direct meeting between the Romans and the Chinese. Although in the end, the kingdoms were so far apart it made little difference, everyone kept enjoying the goods that merchants brought from so far away. The Canadian Clovis Outside the small village of Mortlach in Canada, there is a place called the Casey Jones site. It was from this site where archaeologists collected evidence of some of the very first human encampments in North America. It was Casey Jones himself, an amateur archaeologist, who first came across an arrow point in the early 20th century, then alerted archaeologists. Since then, all kinds of amazing artifacts have been found, and they all date back to the Clovis culture, the very first culture that flourished in North America after the end of the last ice age. What's even more interesting about the discovery is that the Clovis arrow point was discovered by Jones in 1924, and only one other has been found that's like it. The other was discovered in Folsom, New Mexico. This suggests that when the Clovis came to North America, some clearly stayed in the colder regions of Canada, while others in their group marched south and made their homes in the desert. While a lot of people may think of the natives as primitive since they didn't build stone houses, they were just as advanced as their counterparts in Europe. It's believed that from this very site, the Clovis had an encampment and a meat processing facility. They turned raw bison meat into pemmican, then traded it as far south as Minnesota. The Shama Bay Culture A newly discovered site in China has revealed a shocking and previously unidentified Paleolithic culture. This culture was responsible for great technological innovations at a time when massive cultural diversification was happening in Eastern Asia. It was a time of cultural hybridization, 40,000 years ago when Homo sapiens were almost definitely breeding with other forms of hominins. Evidence of the mysterious culture was discovered at the site of Xiama Bay in the Nihewan Basin. There are archaeological sites here that date from 2 million years ago to 10,000 years ago stretching pretty much all of human evolution. Researchers found the earliest evidence of ochre processing here, as well as very ancient stone tools. These stone tools are some of the most interesting finds, since very little in the way of stone technology has been found in China. 
These stone tools are special in that they don't look like stone tools found anywhere else in the world. The blade-like stones, for example, were highly advanced even 40,000 years ago. The blades were incredibly sharp and showed evidence of being latched onto a handle. This may have been the very first culture in China to fix rocks to sticks, sharpen those rocks, and then use them for cutting animal matter, scraping hides, and even performing primitive surgeries. Amazon River Civilization Evidence has been discovered of an ancient Amazon River Civilization, and they were hugely advanced. Laser scans were used to discover the ancient sites hiding along the greatest river in the Amazon, these settlements long abandoned and left to be overgrown. Researchers say the architecture and infrastructure of these cities would have required massive engineering knowledge. They say the people who built the cities were even more technologically skilled than anyone else in South America. That would include the powerful cultures of ancient Peru and Colombia. Take, for example, an ancient site just discovered near the village of Casarabe in northern Bolivia. Hegel Prumers from the University of Bonn investigated the remains of structures deep in the jungle here. Hegel found the eroded remains of pyramid stumps and the crumbling platforms of what had once presumably been temples. This was where the lasers came in. The area was scanned and the scans revealed even more structures hidden underneath the foliage and buried underground. This was a massive culture living centuries before the Spanish showed up, with pyramids so huge they could have rivaled the ones in Egypt. The people of Karahan Tepe Karahan Tepe is a monumental site in the country of Turkey, currently challenging the scientific theory on when and why human beings first settled into villages. Turkish authorities recently excavated this site and learned that it was home to a wildly advanced civilization 11,400 years ago. Archaeologists uncovered houses, a vast ritual complex, and monuments carved into the slope of a hill. The site itself is located in the cradle of civilization, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and yet it thrived long before the days of the Sumerians or Akkadians. What's truly boggling is that the discovery of this ancient complex flips everything we know about the advancement of human civilization on its head. Because, as you might know already, agriculture was not invented 11,400 years ago. The first people to start working the land didn't do so until about 10,000 years ago. And yet, whoever the people were who built the massive ritualistic temples and structure of Karahan Tepe did so without being able to grow their own food. In other words, the existence of this ancient place proves that agriculture was not the cause of settled life, but rather the effect of people settling into villages. Whoever lived here did so without farming a single vegetable for 1,500 years. The Lystrosaurus 250 million years ago, there was a very peculiar animal that lived in South Africa. It's called the Lystrosaurus, or the Shovel Lizard, and it lived throughout the Permian and Triassic eras. It kind of looked like a reptile, but it had mammal-like features and was herbivorous. Its body was about the size of a pig, most similar to that of a wild hog. It even had a pair of tusks that it used to dig up roots and other plant material. But strangely, it didn't have a mouth. It had a beak with the tusks growing out from the side of it. The Lystrosaurus was a very strange creature, by far one of the weirdest ever identified. And like so many prehistoric monsters, much of our understanding of the Lystrosaurus comes from fossils found in the desert. Recently, a collection of extremely rare Lystrosaurus fossils were uncovered in the Karoo Desert of South Africa. They were rare because the fossils still had fragments of skin on them. Even millions of years after they had died, small scraps of skin still clung to their bones. Researchers believe there was a drought that caused the sudden death and mummification of these prehistoric creatures, and that the drought helped to preserve them so well. Amazingly, the Lystrosaurus was one of the few animals that survived the extinction event that killed 70% of life on Earth 252 million years ago. A massive eruption of volcanoes in Siberia wiped out just about all terrestrial animals, but the Lystrosaurus survived because it was one of the first animals that learned how to hibernate. While everything else was dying, this critter was taking a nap underground. The Lost Nile 
The ancient Egyptians built the pyramids of Giza roughly 4,500 years ago. At that time, there was a branch of the Nile River cutting through the desert that does not exist today. A new study has found that there was once an arm of the mighty Nile which likely had a lot to do with how the pyramids were built. Scientists think the extra waterway helped laborers to move massive amounts of building materials from quarries to the construction site. This means there was an extra pathway of water branching off from the Nile. It ran through the desert and brushed up against the site of the pyramids. This channel has since been filled in with sand and completely erased, but scientists were still able to identify it. They used ancient pollen samples taken from deep earth cores to put together a picture of the ancient Nile. They found evidence that there was indeed a branch with a very high water level during the construction of all three pyramids, the Khufu, the Khafre, and the Menkare pyramids. The biggest revelation from this discovery is that the Egyptian pyramids weren't quite as miraculous as many people think. Physical geographer Hader Sheisha from Aix-Marcel University in France says it would have been almost impossible to build the pyramids without this ancient waterway. Up until now, the Egyptians were assumed to have dragged the huge blocks of stone across the desert with nothing but mules and ropes. However, knowing that they had boats and could dock right next to the pyramids makes a world of difference. The pyramids are still great architectural marvels, but the transportation of the stone makes a lot more sense now. The Giant Jar A gigantic ceramic pot was discovered broken into pieces at the ancient Muwayla settlement in the United Arab Emirates. The settlement is located at the edge of Sharjah University City, at the brink of the Great Arabian Desert. The settlement was originally occupied starting about 1100 BC and is considered one of the most important sites from the Iron Age in Arabia. It likely became wildly wealthy thanks to their domestication of camels, which opened up roads for trade. The people here manufactured copper goods, and they traded with nearby settlements and faraway civilizations. But let's get back to the gigantic jar. It was made about 3,000 years ago and was so ridiculously huge that it couldn't fit through a doorway. Archaeologists believe the jar was so gigantic that the building it was housed in had to be constructed around it. Either that, or the pot was made inside the room, and was made too big to ever be taken out of the room. When archaeologists found it, the jar was smashed into small fragments. It took a painfully long time to put the pieces back together so that the jar could go on display at the Sharjah Archaeological Museum. The jar measures a total of 61 inches tall, 55 inches in diameter, and 37 inches around the rim. And nobody has any idea what it was used for or why it was made large enough to fill an entire room. The Monstrous Sea Dragon Towards the end of 2021, the fossil of a monstrous sea dragon was discovered by paleontologists in the Peruvian desert. The sea monster lived 36 million years ago and would have been a frightening thing to behold. Scientists call it a Basilosaurus, and the fossil found in the Okukaje Desert is likely a totally new species. Mario Urbina was the paleontologist behind the discovery. Mario says the Basilosaurus skull was found hiding under the dirt of the desert. Millions of years ago, this grim and unforgiving landscape was covered in water. The desert was a shallow sea rich in biodiversity and was teeming with primitive sea mammals. The Basilosaurus was a very real sea monster. Experts call it a first-order predator, meaning it had first pick of the food chain. It had extraordinarily powerful jaws and sharp teeth that made quick work of any potential meal. It likely feasted on anything it wanted, from penguins to sharks or schools of tuna and sardines. The researchers have dubbed this particular species of Basilosaurus as the Okukaje predator, and they say it was roughly 55 feet long. The Fortresses of Khorezm The ancient territory of Khorezm in the country of Uzbekistan is littered with broken fortresses. This desert landscape is home to dozens of ruined towns that were once constructed to protect the locals from nomadic raids. 
Many of these broken desert fortresses were built as far back as 2,500 years ago and remained in use up until the 13th century. It wasn't until Genghis Khan's violent hordes spilled into the region that many of the fortress towns were broken and abandoned. The Mongols ruined the economy, destroyed civilization, and caused the desert people of the Khorezm to flee into obscurity. Surprisingly, even after 2,500 years in the hostile conditions of the desert, many fortresses still stand today. They have decayed quite a lot over the years and closely resemble sand castles slowly melting on the beach. These buildings are basically open-air, unprotected museums. There are no security guards hanging out, there are no entrance fees, and there are no tourists. As long as you can make your way through Uzbekistan and into the middle of the desolate wasteland, you can explore these lost remnants of a forgotten desert civilization all on your own. Big shout out to Mandy Rude Bennett and Wayne Hersel. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. The Rosetta Stone In July of 1799, a French military engineer in Napoleon Bonaparte's army made a discovery that would change the world. Napoleon was in the middle of his campaign in Egypt, attempting to claim the country for France. It was just one step in his vision of world domination, a vision that never saw fruition. During this crusade, Pierre-Francois Bouchard, a lieutenant under the command of Napoleon, came across a strange black stone near the desert town of Rosetta in the Nile Delta. Bouchard recognized immediately that the object he found was of major importance. And it was. It was the first ancient Egyptian bilingual text discovered in the modern age. The heavy black stone was inscribed with three very different languages. One of the inscriptions was Classical Greece, another was Ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, and the last one was an Egyptian script called Demotic. Bouchard understood instinctively that all three texts said the same thing. He also recognized Classical Greek writing and understood that it could possibly be used as a code to decipher the other two mysterious languages. The Rosetta Stone was pulled from the rubble at the edge of nowhere in Egypt and became the most interesting artifact the world had ever seen. After the French were defeated by the British, they took the Rosetta Stone for themselves and brought it to London. In September of 1822, Jean-Francois Champollion officially translated the text for the first time. Thanks to this stone, we were able to decipher all the hieroglyphics on walls and papyrus scrolls found all over Egypt, unlocking tons of information. New Scorpions Two entirely new species of scorpion have just been discovered in California. These frightening bugs live in the deserts of Central and Southern California, but only in dried up lake beds. The new scorpions are about as frightening as any other species, except very small and with a tiny habitat. They are small enough to curl up in the palm of your hand, and they blend in so well with the desert sand that you'd never even see one coming. One of these species was found in the dried up Soda Lake, and in turn was named Paruroctonus soda. The other was discovered in the Torrid Ken Lake in the Mojave Desert, and was named Paruroctonus conclusus. But here's what makes the two scorpions so exceptional. Each one has adapted to live a very particular lifestyle. These scorpions have evolved to thrive in dry and salty conditions found at the bottom of dried up lakes. For that reason, the yellowish-brown scorpions can only be found hiding in lake beds, making them some of the rarest scorpions in the world. As for how dangerous or venomous the scorpions are, the researchers haven't said anything about that yet. However, as long as you don't go scrounging through empty lakes in the Mojave Desert, they don't pose any type of threat. Rock Art in the Egyptian Desert Archaeologists in Egypt have made a fascinating discovery in the eastern desert. According to the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, a team of American and Egyptian specialists found rock art that dates back to 5,500 years ago. They also discovered a very old burial plot and some mysterious Roman ruins, although those are much more recent. The newly uncovered rock art is from about 3300 BC, from the pre-dynastic era, 
When Egypt was occupied by nomads, tribes, and small settlements of humans, these were what you might consider the uncivilized days of Egypt, long before the invention of hieroglyphs or the creation of the pyramids. Back then, humans lived very primitive lives, and we see proof of this in the eastern desert rock art. The prehistoric Egyptians scrawled images of animals on the dusty red rocks, including pictures of bulls, donkeys, sheep, and giraffes. These were the first true examples of artistic expression in Egypt, long before a more sophisticated artwork was left behind on temple walls. The mysterious burial found by the archaeologists also proved to be interesting. It was dated to the proto-dynastic period of Egypt, or Dynasty Zero, which was around 3250 BC. The grave contained the corpse of a woman who died when she was between 25 and 35 years old. Her grave was filled with goods, such as shells from the Red Sea and carnelian beads, suggesting she had been someone of very high importance. She may have even been a member of the elite ruling class in the days before the mighty pharaoh. Eagle Mountain The ghost town of Eagle Mountain is about 13 miles from Desert Center, California. You can't enter Eagle Mountain because the town is protected by a heavy fence and watched by a small team of security staff. All you can really do is look through the fence and behold the rotting and decaying houses that people in Eagle Mountain once lived in. The only building that is still in use is the school, located just outside the fence and is used for educational courses only. To understand Eagle Mountain and its tragic history, we need to go back to 1948, when Henry Kaiser opened the local iron ore mine. It became the biggest iron mine in Southern California. A railway line was installed to make processing and travel easier, and during the big boom years, homes and towns were built to serve the workers. There were about 400 houses and 4,000 people at its peak. Trailer parks full of mobile homes were also added to the town to serve as housing. In 1981, 35 years after it was founded, mining operations ceased, and the town lost its only source of income. Most of the population left, and the last store closed within a year, in 1982. World War II P-40 In 2012, a Polish oil exploration team in the Sahara Desert of Egypt was investigating the barren wasteland and came across the remains of a fighter plane from World War II. It was a plane that flew with the Royal Air Force of England, and it had been lying in the desert sands since June of 1942. Experts have called the discovery nothing short of a miracle. The chance of stumbling across a lost fighter sitting in the sands of the Egyptian Sahara is about as slim as finding a needle in a haystack. According to British military historian Andy Saunders, the plane was originally flown by Flight Sergeant Dennis Copping. Dennis was allegedly trying to make his way back to the Royal Air Force Base for repairs to his landing gear when he got lost. Dennis Copping became disoriented. The other fighters in the group tried to get his attention, but he strayed away and vanished, and nobody dared follow. Dennis was never seen or heard from again, and his Kitty Hawk P-40 fighter was presumed lost forever. Little did anyone realize it was hundreds of miles from civilization in one of the most isolated places on Earth. The most recent update on this story claimed that the Egyptian authorities agreed to give the airplane back to the British so that they can store it in a museum. The plane has supposedly been recovered from the desert, but still hasn't left Egypt. The Terracotta Warriors a new discovery has been made at the massive burial of China's first great emperor. In the mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang, even more terracotta warriors have been found belonging to his army of the afterlife. The terracotta army was created 2,200 years ago and was one of the greatest discoveries ever made. 100 years after the emperor's death, the tomb was lost until the 20th century. About 20 new warriors were just discovered inside the emperor's grave in Shanxi province. The new sculptures were found in pit number one, not far from the emperor's secret tomb. They were found in almost pristine condition and included statues of a general and middle-ranking army officers. 
In total, pit number one has over 6,000 pottery figures and horses, each one sculpted to be part of the Emperor's Terracotta Army. This army is the only collection of military sculptures that was produced on such a grand scale. It's believed Qin Shi Huang, who was the first man to unify China under one rule, had an army of over 500,000 soldiers. Researchers also believe it took about 700,000 laborers, nearly four decades, to complete all the statues in the tomb. Although the warriors are now ancient and without color, it's believed they may have once been painted with exquisite detail. Some of them may have even been a bright red color, like an army of angry demons. As for why the warriors would have been painted red is a total mystery. The buried army faces east, ready for battle outside of the wall of the actual tomb. The emperor's final resting place itself has never been opened due to preservation concerns and the possibility of booby traps. Egyptian Sarcophagus An exceptional new sarcophagus has just been unearthed in the desert sands near Cairo in Egypt. The coffin of time Wea was found in the megalithic Saqqara necropolis. It's been hidden underground, undisturbed in its burial chamber for 3,000 years. Archaeologists have described the coffin as a dream discovery. Ola Elagizi, a professor of archaeology at Cairo University, is the one who uncovered the entrance to the tomb and then the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. Ola and her team first identified a vertical shaft in a courtyard in Saqqara, a clear indication of a tomb below. The shaft was roughly 24 feet deep, and it took a week of relentless work just to remove the sand using a bucket and rope. With the sand gone, Ola then used the same bucket and rope to be lowered into the tomb to see it for herself. According to what she told news sources, finding an unopened sarcophagus in its original tomb is exceptionally rare. Most of these tombs have been pillaged by grave robbers, and finding one without damage is like finding a needle in a haystack. We know who the sarcophagus belonged to because their name is carved into the giant granite lid. The inscription reads, Ta Emwia. He is described as the head of treasury for King Ramses II, who was arguably the greatest pharaoh in ancient Egyptian history. Ramses II ruled from 1279 to 1213 BC in the 19th dynasty, and Taim Wea was probably very close to him. On the lid of his sarcophagus was the emblem of the sky goddess Nut, her wings outstretched to protect the deceased. Pure Gold Dozens of pure gold coins from about 1400 years ago have just been found in a secret stash spot. These incredibly valuable coins were found stuffed into the base of a wall at the Banias archaeological site in Israel. Researchers believe the 44 pieces of gold were hidden by the owner of the property in the moments before he or she fled. The owner was most likely hoping to come back for their treasure one day, but clearly never did. Archaeologists believe the treasure was buried in the year 635 AD. This was during the Muslim conquest of Israel, at the end of the Byzantine era when rapid global change was happening. The Islamic conquests were happening all over the Mediterranean, North Africa, and the Near East. The gold coins and the stash were minted about two decades before they were hidden. Some of the coins appear to be from the rule of Emperor Phocas, who ruled from 602 to 610. Some of the others were from his successor, Emperor Heraclius, who ruled from 610 to 641. Another interesting part of the discovery is that the town of Banyas is significant in the Bible. It was the place where Jesus told the Apostle Peter, On this rock I will build my church. The Naga of Angkor A new treasure has been discovered in the famous Angkor complex at Siem Reap, Cambodia. A sandstone Naga's head was recently spotted near the Tep Pranam Temple inside the ancient city of Angkor Thom in the Angkor Archaeological Park. It all happened when a tree fell over, revealing the gigantic stone naga hiding in its roots. Somehow the statue broke, the head of the frightening snake got buried underground, and the tree grew its roots around it. It was about three feet below the surface, tangled up in the roots like it was caught in an underground spiderweb. If you're not sure what a naga is, let me quickly explain. The Naga is a divine race of half-human and half-serpent beings who live in the netherworld. They occasionally take human form. They have magical powers, and people in South Asia have worshipped them as supernatural deities for thousands of years. Depictions of Naga can be found in Hinduism, Buddhism, or Jainism. 
Researchers are now saying the Naga's head may have been built at the same time as the Bayan Temple 800 years ago. It was likely sculpted in the 12th century under the reign of Jayavarman VII. After the great city of Angkor was abandoned, many of the temples and structures fell into disrepair. The statue must have broken off and hit the ground, then was slowly absorbed and buried. Big shout out to Lashima Marshall and Prayer Abdiel. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. We'd love to have you! Giant Hercules Statue Speaking of incredible statues, archaeologists in Greece have just uncovered what might be the most impressive statue of Hercules ever. The statue is about 2,000 years old and was found in the ancient city of Philippi in the north. The discovery was unveiled by the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports and was hailed as larger than life. It was found smashed into pieces, but still in good condition. The pieces were able to be put back together for the most part, depicting a strong and youthful Hercules, who of course is one of the most famous heroes in mythology. This stone Hercules was originally sculpted holding a club, a wreath, and draped in lion skin. The statue itself was unearthed at an ancient intersection, a place where the avenues had been widened to make room for a square with a fountain and the statue. 2,000 years ago, any Roman wandering down the street would have been able to sit in the shade cast by the giant Hercules, wash their face in the fountain, and take a break before continuing on their way. Mysterious Medieval Pub In northern England, researchers believe they may have just found the remnants of a medieval pub. Archaeologist Emma Samuel says she and her team discovered a large number of pottery beakers and old jugs, many of which seem to have held alcohol or other beverages. The beakers date back to around the 13th century, or roughly 800 years ago. Judging by the size of the collapsed structure, it was either a pub or a large house. It may have also been a kind of inn where travelers could rest on long journeys. In all likelihood, there would have been rooms in the building for weary wanderers to relax their bones, and they could have gone into the public room to order something to eat and drink. After all, pub is only a shortened form of public house a place where people could eat, sleep, drink, and socialize. Emma and the other archaeologists also found carefully butchered sheep and cattle bones, suggesting a full dining experience. Ancient Herders Camp In Iran, archaeologists recently discovered an ancient camp once occupied by a group of primitive herders. The camp was found at the top of a mountain during a survey project in Mausolei and dated to be 7,000 years old. The research team came across traces of late Neolithic activity about 8,000 feet above sea level. The camp was built near one of the tallest peaks in the Talesh Mountains and was likely used seasonally by prehistoric herders who tended large flocks of animals. The site is now the oldest of its kind found south of the Caspian Sea at such a high elevation, and researchers are struggling to find out what it all means. The settlement seems to suggest the Neolithic herders favored the pastures of the mountaintops. The camp was made right around the time that hunting and gathering was slowly becoming obsolete. Human beings in Iran were no longer fully nomadic and had taken to tending animals rather than spending all their energy hunting them. This is called nomadic pastoralism, and it was semi-nomadic in that the herders continuously moved their animals to greener pastures. They chased the seasons, and that way their herds could eat, and so could they. Roman Zodiac Coin Archaeologists in Israel just found a bronze coin in a very unlikely place. It was discovered at the bottom of the sea, and it dates back to one of the best eras of the Roman Empire. On one side of the coin is Luna, the Roman goddess of the moon. This helped researchers date the coin at 1,850 years old, minted during the rule of Emperor Antoninus Pius. Antoninus ruled Rome between 138 and 161 AD during a surprisingly peaceful period in Europe. He came into power after Emperor Hadrian, who had tried to brutally subjugate the Jewish people and absorb the province of Judea. Hadrian was notorious for selling Jewish prisoners into slavery and forbidding the worship of Yahweh or reading the Torah. When Antoninus came into power, things greatly improved for the Jewish people. It took only about a year for him to abolish the laws that specifically targeted Jews. He was also unique in that he preferred to delegate rather than use force. 
He looked to local governors to solve issues instead of sending in the military. The coin isn't much to look at these days. It's turned green from centuries in the sea. Still, it's a reminder of one of the last peaceful eras in Rome, before things took a violent turn and stayed that way for centuries. Mysterious Clay Tablet In Israel, a six-year-old boy named Imri Elia made a shocking archaeological discovery. He came across a mysterious clay tablet during a hike that was dated to be 3,500 years old. The ancient tablet shows a man, potentially a slave, and his captor. The boy was on a trip to the famous Tel Jemeh archaeological site in Israel's Negev desert with his parents when it happened. He picked up the small clay tablet from the ground, showed it to his parents, and they contacted the Israel Antiquities Authority. The artifact then changed hands and wound up in the National Treasures Department. Researchers believe they know exactly what the clay tablet is depicting. It appears to have come from the biblical Canaanite civilization. The captor is wearing clothes, while his captive subject is entirely naked. During the time when the tablet was made, around 1500 BC, the land of Canaan was ruled over by the Egyptians. This tablet most likely shows a Canaanite man and his Egyptian subjugator. Ancient Taiwanese Skull In Taiwan, an archaeological research team discovered a skull and femur 6,000 years old. The bones were found hidden in the back of a dark and creepy cave high up in the mountains. The team believes the bones came from one of the first humans to ever inhabit Taiwan. This individual was on the island before the ancestors of the current inhabitants ever arrived. Stories passed down through generations for thousands of years describes an ancient tribe of extremely short people with dark skin who lived in mountainous parts of the island. This mysterious tribe was in Taiwan even when the modern ancestors of the Taiwanese people arrived. Some stories have the tribe being an enemy. Some say they were hermits and just wanted to keep to themselves. Even though these tales have been told for thousands of years, there has never been any physical evidence of a tribe in the mountains found. That is, until now. Researchers say the cranial morphometric study done on the remains proved that there was a group of primitive people living in Taiwan 6,000 years ago. These people were extremely small, only about 3 feet 9 inches tall. They possibly descended from an even older and more remote population of humans or hominids. They may be so ancient they weren't entirely Homo sapiens. Unfortunately, it does not appear that any of their relatives have survived into modern times. Researchers have confirmed the existence of the ancient people, but they still don't know what happened to them. Legends say most of them were already gone when the Austronesian groups started arriving on the island. Other legends have it that the mountain people were viciously wiped out about 1,000 years ago. Ancient Egyptian Priestess In late 2017, archaeologists uncovered the tomb of a powerful priestess from Egypt's Old Kingdom period. Found near the Great Pyramid of Giza, the 4,400-year-old burial belonged to an influential woman named Hetpet and was covered in remarkably well-preserved paintings of her engaging in various activities. The work depicts the priestess hunting, fishing, and receiving offerings from children. It also shows workers smelting metal and building papyrus boats, and features monkeys picking fruits and dancing in front of musicians. Images like these are incredibly rare, according to Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, Mustafa Waziri, who told AFP that archaeologists had been looking for Hetpet's tomb for over a century. He explained that the search began in 1909, after a group of German archaeologists came across a collection of artifacts bearing her name. Hetpet was a priestess of the fertility, music, and dance goddess Hathor, who assisted women during childbirth. She lived during the Old Kingdom's Fifth Dynasty and was a high-ranking official with close ties to the royal palace at a time when female priests were rare. Secret Cave after heavy flooding damaged much of the inventory at her boutique in Ellicott City, Maryland in 2016, Kelly Myers began looking for a new storefront to rent. She called up a friend who owned a commercial property that had also been damaged in the flood, but not as badly, to talk about renting out the space. The friend told Myers to come over right away and said that he had just discovered a secret cave. Measuring 12 feet wide and 8 feet tall at its center, it was a fairly sizable space. 
It had been hand carved into the bedrock and contained no traces of what it was originally used for or when it was built. The cave was discovered by workers who were repairing a house that had been built almost 200 years ago in 1840 leading to two main theories regarding its use. One possibility is that it was used as a stop along the Underground Railroad, which would make sense because the town's Quaker population was anti-slavery and the original landowners were Quakers. Adding to the likelihood of this theory is the fact that several other suspected Underground Railroad fixtures have been found throughout Ellicott City, including tunnels and trapdoors that may have once led to safe houses. It's also possible that the cave functioned as a Prohibition-era storage space for bootlegged whiskey. At the time, numerous pharmacies along the city's historic Main Street were quick to prescribe alcohol to someone even if they just had a cough. The cave may have been a safe place for pharmacists to stash their surplus. Historical records revealed that it was used for storing beer long before Prohibition during the 1860s, when a saloon was located on the property. But this may not have been the cave's original purpose, which may not be mentioned in any documents, especially if it was meant to be a secret. The Bridge of Nero As Italy struggles with a historically severe drought and water shortage, water levels are hitting their lowest point in years. The Tiber River's dropping waters recently exposed the ruins of a first-century stone structure called the Pons Neronianus, or the Bridge of Nero. Nero served as the fifth Roman emperor from 54 to 68 AD. The controversial ruler drained the city's coffers on the many public structures he commissioned in an effort to rebuild Rome after a major fire destroyed much of the city. Remember the fire where he played the fiddle while Rome burned? But it's uncertain whether Nero built the recently exposed bridge, which has appeared several times in the past amid low water levels. It may have been built before Nero's rise to power and was most likely a reconstruction of a previous crossing, according to architect Nicholas Temple. Archaeologist Robert Coates Stevens told the website that a bridge would have likely provided easy access to the lavish gardens and properties he built in the area near the Vatican. Several scholars said that it was located in a poorly chosen site along a tight river bend, where the waters that cut through the sediment would have likely separated the riverbanks from the fixtures holding the bridge in place. Evidence suggests that this may have been what happened to Nero's bridge, and that it likely occurred by the middle of the 3rd century, at which point the structure was taken apart and reassembled in a more ideal location. While the bridge held some religious and military significance, it was implemented at a time when not a whole lot was going on in the area near the modern-day Vatican, which consisted of wealthy homes. Duke University historian Mary Boatwright said that she'd rather the bridge be submerged rather than for Italy to be struggling with a drought. Early Bronze Age Grave Construction workers were renovating a kindergarten in western Slovakia recently when they discovered an ancient grave. Inside were the remains of a woman who was buried on her left side in a curled position. She was laid to rest wearing an array of jewelry, including bone beads, a copper bracelet, and earrings. Archaeologists dated the burial to around 4,000 years ago, during the Early Bronze Age, and identified it as belonging to one of the region's oldest societies, known as the Nitra culture. Their existence was characterized by the gradual introduction of bronze production, which combined copper and tin to make a stronger, harder metal. Archaeologists excavating at the school said it was a little different from working at a traditional site because the students all gathered to watch as the work went on. It was a good opportunity for them to learn about the history of the region's ancestors. Specific details about the woman, including things like her age and social class, have yet to be revealed. What was your favorite history lesson you learned in school? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Milwaukee Shipwreck Built in 1836 in Grand Island, New York, the Milwaukee was a 113-foot-long, three-mastered schooner that sank in Lake Michigan during a catastrophic storm in 1842. After spending all day loading a cargo of flour, the captain raised the ship's anchor and set sail for Buffalo, despite expectations of bad weather. The Milwaukee lost its battle against Mother Nature that night and went down near the small city of Saugatuck, making it one of the first ships to wreck along the shore of western Michigan. Legend has it that the crew wanted to remain anchored until the storm passed, 
but that the captain was getting impatient and decided to sail even though he knew it was a bad idea. Six of the ship's 13 crew members survived, while the others did not. Scuba divers and wreck enthusiasts Kevin and Amy Ailes recently made news headlines for locating what they believe to be the vessel's remains. They have found five wrecks over the last decade, including the one they just discovered, which they found with the help of satellite imagery and sonar technology. Surprisingly, it sits just a few hundred feet from the shore. Very little remains of the wreck, which has yet to be officially identified as the Milwaukee. But the dimensions of what's left of it match the ship's measurements, and all signs point toward it being the long-missing vessel. Waterloo Burial On June 18, 1815, in what is now Belgium, a French army under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte fought against a Prussian army and an army made up of Britain and its allies. Known as the Battle of Waterloo, it was Napoleon's final defeat after 23 years of warfare between France and other parts of Europe. Archaeologists and volunteers recently unearthed a human skeleton, several amputated limbs, boxes of ammunition, and the remains of three or more horses at the battle site. The discovery was made in an area that was used as an Allied field hospital, now known as the Mont Saint-Jean Farm, as part of the Waterloo Uncovered project, which helps veterans cope with combat trauma through meaningful and healing archaeological projects. It's likely that the grave's contents were hastily dumped and buried to prevent disease from spreading throughout the battlefield's hospital, according to archaeologist Veronique Moulard, who spoke with the Brussels Times. The horses all appear to have been shot to death as an act of mercy as they suffered excruciating injuries. Team member Tony Pollard described the discovery as unlike anything he's ever seen in his 20-year career, and that there is no getting closer to the harsh reality of Waterloo than this. Once the grave is fully excavated, the human skeleton will be analyzed in hopes of determining the person's age and gender. It's in remarkably good condition, which is a rare find, but the team believes they may have come across more human remains as they continue to dig. Neolithic Houses Archaeologists recently announced the discovery of the oldest known man-made building in the United Arab Emirates. Found on the island of Gaga off Abu Dhabi, the stone structure represents the remains of a Neolithic dwelling thought to date back to 8,500 years ago. A carbon isotope analysis revealed that the ruins are around 500 years older than any other known structures found before in the country. Prior to the discovery, it was widely believed that people began settling in the region later on in the Neolithic period during the expansion of maritime trade routes, according to Mohammed al-Mubarak, who heads Abu Dhabi's Department of Culture and Tourism. The new findings reveal that people actually lived in the area long before trade evolved there. All that's left of the rounded structures are the remnants of walls that stand at just three feet tall today. The team that discovered the structures believes that they housed a small community that lived on the island full-time. In addition to these small homes, archaeologists found arrowheads, indicating that the inhabitants hunted. The settlement's proximity to the sea means that they also most likely fished. Someone was buried at the site around 5,000 years ago, after it was abandoned, indicating that the structures held continued cultural and historic importance to the people who lived in the area death hunter-gatherer. Around 100,000 years ago, a hunter-gatherer in what is now Morocco suffered from debilitating vertigo and hearing loss. Scientists recently made this discovery while re-examining parts of the person's skull that were found a half century ago. Using sophisticated software and an advanced imaging technique known as micro-CT scan, they found details that would have been hard to spot decades ago before today's more advanced technology existed. While examining the skull to determine which human group it belonged to, a researcher noticed that parts of the person's ear were ossified, meaning they had turned into bone when they shouldn't have. This is a sign of a disease called labyrinthitis ossificans, which comes with a host of unpleasant symptoms, including balance issues, dizziness, vertigo, and hearing loss. The person only lived for a few months after the disease's onset, begging the question of whether the condition played a role in his death. He would have no longer been able to hunt and get food on his own, and would have needed a lot of help from others. The fact that he lived for a short time after his symptoms appeared shows that people were looking out for him, 
at least for a little while. This is one of just two known examples of the condition being discovered in the fossilized remains of human hunter-gatherers, making it one of the oldest identified cases of acquired deafness among Homo sapiens. Coffee Archaeologists in Melbourne recently confirmed the city's status as Australia's coffee capital, with the discovery of 167-year-old coffee beans among the remains of an old grocery store. They were excavating the site in 2018 ahead of the construction of a new rail line, when they unearthed the beans, along with a bunch of other artifacts. Known as the John Connell General Store, the business burned down during the country's gold rush era, which lasted from 1851 to 1914. In addition to 500 or so coffee beans, numerous other food items were preserved in the fire, including English biscuits and fruit remains. Normally, these perishables would have naturally disintegrated over time, but they were carbonized by the flames, preserving them in a similar fashion to the ruins at Pompeii. The coffee beans are an especially meaningful find, given Melbourne's reputation as a coffee-loving city. Members of the public are hoping that the unique items will be put on display. Warsaw Ghetto Artifacts In 1943, the Nazis established the Warsaw Ghetto in Poland. Roughly 460,000 Jews were confined to the site, which occupied a mere 1.3 square miles. Archaeologists working to excavate the ghetto recently unearthed a plethora of artifacts, including shoes, tableware, ceramic tiles, diary pages, burned books, and book pages in Polish and Hebrew. The team is digging near a memorial mound dedicated to Mordecai Anielewicz, who headed a resistance movement called the Jewish Combat Organization. It's believed that he died in 1943 during an uprising following the deportation of many of the ghetto's residents to death camps. Archaeologist and historian Jacek Koenig told local news station that the Jewish Combat Organization members who participated in the demonstration most likely took their own lives as they were surrounded by the Germans. One of the first artifacts the team found is a brown leather slipper that was probably worn by a Jewish child. Sadly, nothing is known of the shoe's owner other than the fact that they presumably never got a chance to grow up. Some of the written materials that have been discovered contain first-hand accounts of the events that went on within the ghetto's combines and will undoubtedly help modern researchers learn more about this painful period in world history. Additionally, the team has found what appear to be the remains of a secret shelter located beneath several townhouses. Many of the artifacts were found within the passage, which has six entrances. Excavations are ongoing and are being carried out with the help of volunteers who are playing an important part in raising awareness about the reality of what countless people suffered through at the hands of the Nazi. The Hollow Earth Expedition In December of 1923, a pair of explorers named Nicholas and Helena Rorich traveled to Darjeeling, India. They went there to explore the Tibetan Plateau, a land that is still considered forbidden, and the whole point was to look for the fabled city of Shambhala. The two explorers, who happened to be Russian expatriates, were joined by Soviet spies, mysterious cultists, and Mongolian rebels. Everyone had their own purpose in mind for finding the mysterious city, and after a lot of arguing with the authorities, they were finally allowed into Tibet. According to Tibetan myth, as well as the Buddhist and Hindu belief systems, Shambhala is thought to be a kind of heavenly city which exists on both the physical and spiritual plane. The city has never been found because it's generally understood to be a metaphor, not a real place. However, Nicholas and Helena were determined to find it anyway. They were convinced Shambhala was real and that it was accessible through a passage in the earth that would lead down to an undiscovered world that was just underneath the surface. In the 1920s, explorers weren't the only ones who wanted to find this hidden city. The English, the Russians, the Japanese, Mongolians, everyone wanted to find this city for themselves. Unfortunately, nobody has ever found it. The expedition lost contact with the outside world in 1927, and the Rowriches were considered dead. In reality, they had gotten into a violent conflict with the armed forces in Tibet and spent five months in a detainment camp. Afterward, the family walked all the way back to India. 
They tried to go look for the lost city again in 1933, but this time were denied access to the area. The Arctic Atlantis In the year 1811, Russian explorer Yakov Sanikov was surveying an archipelago north of Norilsk in the far eastern part of Siberia. While he was mapping these islands, he caught a glimpse of another island very far away. He wanted to reach the island to see what it was, but every time he got close, the island seemed to get farther away. This was fascinating because the people of Siberia have long been aware of a strange legend told by the Chukchi people. They spoke of a tribe called the Ankylons, who moved to a mysterious Arctic island long ago. This fabled island became something of a Russian Atlantis, a place that supposedly held a great city and a mysterious lost people, yet nobody seemed capable of finding it. In 1899, the Russian Academy of Sciences invited young and ambitious explorer Baron Edward von Tall to lead an expedition. His job was to discover the island and map it at all costs, and see if it really did hold a lost city. On June 21, 1900, the Zarya research vessel departed St. Petersburg, but the ship did not get nearly as far as the crew was hoping. They got trapped in the Arctic for the winter, pressed on again in May of 1901, and got stuck again soon after. In June of 1902, Baron Edward von Toll took three companions and set off across the ice on their own to reach Bennett Island, where they hoped they could continue searching for the Arctic Atlantis. Sadly, none of them were ever seen again. Paititi Explorers and adventurers have been searching for the lost city of Paititi in the Peruvian Andes for a very long time. Paititi was supposedly the last city of the Inca Empire to fall to the Spanish. It was the final stronghold and the last sanctuary for the Inca before they were fully subjugated and their kingdom came crashing down around them. Yet every scientist and explorer who ventured into the high-altitude wilderness to find this city has been met with either failure or death. Still, to this day, even with the technology we have available to us, nobody has ever found the location of Paititi. The most devastating expedition took place in 1971, when Bob Nichols, Serge Chipru, and George Puel traveled up the Rio Pantiacoya in search of the lost city. Sadly, after 30 days, their agreement with their local guides terminated, and the three explorers were abandoned in the jungle. They could have gone back to civilization, but chose to continue into uncharted territory instead. They were never seen again, and it's generally believed they were killed while making their way through the forest. Lopnur About 2,000 years ago, Lulan was a small but prosperous city on the Silk Road. The city rose up on the shores of Lopnur Lake at a time when the region was much more hospitable. But since the days of the Silk Road, the lake has turned into a vast desert of sand dunes. It's now a place of death rather than life, just northeast of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region in China. The city of Lulan was lost until about 100 years ago, when it was stumbled upon by Swedish explorer Sven Hedin buried underneath the sand. This lost city would soon claim the life of a different explorer, a brilliant scientist named Peng Jiamu. In 1979, Peng was elevated to the prestigious position of vice president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. One of the things he really wanted to do was explore the Lop Desert. Its lake once contained many different species of fish, and it had been the life source for villages that surrounded it. Even though the temperature here was extreme, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, the ancient people were able to sustain themselves using the lake. However, as the lake dried up, so too did the villages. In 1980, Peng Jiamu walked into the Lop Desert and was never seen again. He had been with his team doing scientific research in this desolate region when he wandered away in search of water and never returned. His disappearance remains a mystery. Australian Outback Ludwig Leichhardt was a Prussian scientist who disappeared in 1848 with seven other men. To this day, nobody knows exactly what happened to him. Ludwig was a natural scientist and he had exploration in his blood. His main point of interest was Australia, 
He wanted to trek across the Australian outback, making his way from the eastern coast to the western coast. This would involve crossing all the forbidding, dangerous, and unknown lands of the Australian interior on horseback. Ludwig was already a famous explorer in Australia. He had already gone overland diagonally from the east coast to the northwest tip of the continent. It took about 18 months to complete, and he returned from his journey in 1846. Then, after a bit of a rest, Ludwig set out to do an even bigger task in 1848, exploring the middle of Australia. At the time, nobody knew what was hiding in the center of Australia. It could have been lost cities filled with treasure, strange rainforests with curious animals, or anything at all. No one had ever journeyed through the desolate center before, and so this was a big deal. Sadly, it also turned out to be a serious tragedy. Ludwig and his party were last seen on April 3, 1848, at McPherson Station on the Darling Downs. He rode off into the sunset with seven men, 20 mules, and seven horses, but neither he nor his men were ever found. What do you think happened to Ludwig Leichhardt in the Australian outback? Let us know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Land of Lioness the land of Lioness is supposedly hiding underneath the raging sea just beyond Land's End at the southern tip of the UK. Some even say that on a clear day when the sea is calm, you can just barely catch a glimpse of the last domes and spires of the great city sitting at the bottom of the ocean. According to local folklore, the mythical land stretched all the way from Land's End to the Isles of Scilly. Some have speculated that this mysterious land was where King Arthur fought his legendary battle against Mordred in storybooks. The land was said to be fertile and its people were prosperous. However, it was suddenly destroyed by a fierce act of Mother Nature. Over 2,000 years ago in the 11th century, a tidal wave smashed against the city and drowned it. All its lands and people were lost in the blink of an eye. What's really interesting is that this mythical place could be real. Archaeological remains have been found in high water near the Isles of Scilly. Data has shown that there was a large and rapid loss of land between 2500 BC and 2000 BC. The Cornwall Archaeological Unit has confirmed that much of the land around the Isles of Scilly were lost underwater, suggesting there could have once been a great city and kingdom here. We'll just have to wait and see. Libertatia According to legend, there was a democratic colony of pirates living in peace and harmony on the coast of Madagascar in the 17th century. They used the funds from their pirating to bankroll the colony and built themselves a blissful utopia. They called this place Libertatia, and it supposedly flourished for about 20 years before being swept away and forgotten. However, nobody knows for sure if this place really did exist. What we mainly know about the mysterious pirate city comes from a history of pirates written by Captain Charles Johnson in 1726. Almost all the tales in Johnson's book have been proven true, based on one historical truth or another, and so most historians believe that based on the author's sturdy reputation, Libertatia was a real place. The biggest issue is that nobody has ever been able to find it. Journalist Kevin Rushby searched all across the African coast looking for the lost pirate city, traveling through Mozambique, the Comoros Islands, and also Madagascar. He found people who claimed to be the descendants of pirates who had settled in Africa, but never physically found any remains of a real pirate paradise. The Lost City of Z Colonel Percy Fawcett was a British explorer who went on seven expeditions between 1906 and 1924. His obsession was to be the first to discover the fabled lost city of Z. He believed wholeheartedly that somewhere in the Brazilian jungle was a glorious city from long before the Europeans ever arrived in South America. He thought the city was thousands of years old and that it would contain tons of treasure and he would be the first foreigner to ever lay eyes on it. Unfortunately for Percy Fawcett, his expedition in 1925 was his last. He walked into the Brazilian jungle with his son Jack, whom he was hoping would become a brave and bold adventurer like himself. However, neither of them were ever seen again. 
Since then, historians, explorers, and adventurers have failed to find his remains or understand what happened to him. While we can't be certain what exactly happened to the explorer, there are some theories. The Danish explorer Arne Fagron journeyed back to the jungle in the 1960s and learned that Percy and Jack had been killed by an indigenous tribe. They had apparently gotten into a misunderstanding and their corpses were thrown into the river. And yet in 1979, Percy Fawcett's very own signet ring was allegedly discovered in a pawn shop. This led to a theory that claimed Percy and his companions were murdered by bandits and not by the indigenous people. The last theory, and maybe the most realistic, is that Percy Fawcett failed to find the city and was too embarrassed to return to England. So he founded a commune in the jungle and lived there for the rest of his life in secret. The funny thing is that he was right all along, and recent studies have shown that there were once enormous cities in the Amazon. The Seven Cities of Cibola In the 16th century, Spanish explorers believed in the Seven Cities of Cibola, mythical lands filled with so much gold the Spanish would never need to pillage again. This place was supposedly somewhere in the southwest of North America, spoken of by eyewitnesses who saw the brilliant cities for themselves in 1527. The rumor of a great city quickly spread through the Spanish legions that had been pillaging their way across the New World. Then, in 1540, Francisco Vázquez de Coronado began his journey into North America to try and find it. However, his efforts were all for nothing, and he never did discover it. All the Spanish conquistador managed to do was kill huge numbers of Native Americans. He and his company traveled from Compostela in Mexico to what would later be New Mexico, but they found no trace of any city of gold. He destroyed every local community he came across until he learned of an even greater city of gold hiding to the north. It was a legendary place called Quivira, positively brimming with wealth. Coronado's journey took him all the way to modern-day Kansas, but it was too late when he learned that the natives had made up the story about the city of gold. They created it as a way to make him leave, hoping Coronado and his Spaniards would go away into the wilderness and die. He didn't perish in the wilderness, but he did go bankrupt from his expedition. Coronado soon became something of a laughingstock for chasing after a city that didn't even exist. The failed El Dorado expedition Sir Walter Riley set out in February of 1595 to find the mythical city of El Dorado. He and his team of English military men traveled up the Orinoco River on the northeastern tip of South America in one of the most dramatic explorations ever. They came across the Spanish settlement of San Jose de Uruna, captured it, and then kept going. They traveled over 400 miles into the Guiana Highlands in search of the lost city of gold, which happened to be on the tongue of just about every explorer in the New World. The Spanish, the French, the Portuguese, the English, they all knew about El Dorado and were desperate to find it. Riley and his team never found El Dorado, but they did venture very far into mostly unexplored territory. As they went, they made alliances with the indigenous people. The English were famous enemies of the Spanish, and the Spanish were detested by just about every single group of people in South America. The English used this to their advantage and made friends with the natives. When Riley went back to England, he left two of his men behind with the local Amerindians. But when he got back home, he was received with great displeasure. He didn't bring back any gold, and those who had invested money in his expedition were furious with him. He was accused of hiding his riches in a remote region so that he wouldn't have to share his wealth. Thanks for watching! Would you ever volunteer for an expedition to a lost city knowing you might not come back? Let me know in the comments below and remember to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!